All right. It's recorded. <laughs> okay. Yeah. yeah. Got it. Yes. All right. Yeah, it was a, I was I was just responding because he's was, yeah. was going directly to me. Yeah, no, <laughs> no, no, no worries. Okay, y'all, everybody can hear you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it is 11 o'clock and we're going to get started. Hello, everybody. This is Mary. Um, I'm going to share my screen and do a quick intro. Hold on. Sorry, should have had that ready. Okay, so welcome to Refract versus New Drilling Economics by Bob Barbe, sponsored by InVenture. Um, as you know, we're using Zoom platform, so I wanted to go over a couple of key buttons that we have uh, that are available right now. You were all admitted into the room on mute. You can unmute yourself, but if you would, please just keep it on mute um, unless you have a question. And if you have a question, if you'd raise your hand first so that we know that you have a question and then Bob can call on you and then unmute yourself. Um, so we just don't want to have any barking dogs or crying kids or whatever else you got going on in your house uh, interrupting the meeting. Um, also, you have the option to show your pretty face or you can, um, leave it on um, stop video and we'll just have your name up and that's fine too it's your preference uh, also there are those uh, buttons the nonverbal feature uh, that goes with um, uh, with zoom so you can raise your hand you can do a thumbs up thumbs down if you need to step away from your computer and take a quick coffee break you can put your coffee cup up so we know that you're still there but you're you know uh, stepped away that's fine either way. Um, but a little bit about Bob Barbe. He spent a lot of his time with Schlumberger, and as I said, he was out in the field a lot. While he was at Schlumberger, he, uh, he was the product champion for uh, several of uh, Schlumberger's successful products. Spent uh, 24 years consulting, and uh, or over 24 years now, right, Bob? And uh, <laughs> So he's also just served as an SPE Distinguished Lecturer. He's implemented uh, integration process in a variety of reservoirs all over North America. And uh, we are proud to have uh, Bob as an instructor for SCA. As such, and most related to this class is his Refract Candidate Selection Execution and Performance Evaluation class. It's a two-day class, and if the world cooperates, uh, we may be able to um, uh, open up hopefully well before November 4th and 5th to be able to have this class. Um, so that's it for the intro, Bob. If I'm going to stop sharing my screen and then you could share yours. We know the, the poll next. Poll. Oh, see, that's what I keep you around for. <laughs> okay, we've got a couple of poll, quick poll questions for you guys. If you would, the uh, first one is what is your primary discipline? So if you'll click on either geoscience, drilling engineer, completion engineer, production engineer, or other. Um, is it working? Because I don't see anybody clicking. Hmm. Okay. I don't, got one. Oh, there we go. We've got one person who's clicked. Can everybody else try? Is anybody there? Let's see. I'm seeing some others. Okay, here we go. All right, there's just a few of us replying here. The next question is how many years of experience you have? Less than one year, one to 10 years, 11 to 20 years, 21 to 30, or over 30. And that, oops, and I misspelled the word there. Have you done any organic shell refracts? And if so, what kind of diverter did you use? Was it a PLA or other chemical diverters, pod diverter, cemented liner? expandable liner. And then the last question we have is what kind of company do you work for, operator, if you're a consultant, or a service company? So I'm going to end the poll. And then those are the results. Okay. 
Okay, let me get off of here. All right, Bob, if you want to go ahead and start sharing your screen. Yeah, on the bottom here. Yep, go to the bottom. Am I shared? Uh, give it a second to pop up. Nope, I don't see you yet. It's Alt S, I think, right? Yeah, did you push the little green button? Sorry, guys. Give us a few seconds. All right, it worked earlier. What happened? <laughs> Right, and my, my little bar is right underneath the thing. <laughs> the search button is right underneath the oh. doing all tests. Is... Hmm. Here it comes. Here it comes. There it goes. Okay. All right. All right. I'm going on mute and um My smiling face is there. Yeah, okay. All right. Everything look good? Everybody see the screen okay? Looks good. Looks good. Great. Great. Well, good morning. Great. Thanks for coming to our session this morning. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about organic shell racks. Are, are they going to work at today's prices, at the current prices? Uh, the answer, is, of course, is yes, or we wouldn't be doing this, but uh, we want to give you a little bit of background on that so everybody feels comfortable with our, you know, with our assumptions here. I started with Refrax uh, about, oh, back in 2008, I started getting interested in Refrax because we've, we've done a lot of major reservoir characterization projects <coughs> and found a lot of stranded hydrocarbons out there from you know, the people just not using best practices, people assuming that Frax did things that they don't do. Uh, you know, they, you know, a lot of the completion designs were designed by people that looked like they thought the Frax were reserve seeking missiles. You know, they would find the oil and gas that's there and Clearly, they're not. They're, they're, they're driven by in situ stress and by you know, rock properties and all that. But the, uh, the result was we saw a lot of fields with a lot of oil and gas left behind. Uh, new gas fields uh, were 10% recovery factor, which isn't even a good recovery factor for a solution gas drive oil reservoir, much less a gas reservoir. So we, when the prices dropped back in 2008, uh, we started, we shifted our well performance course to a refrac, dedicated refrac optimization course. And I've uh, been doing that ever since then. Uh, and it's been up and down, as we'll talk about. You know, it's, it's kind of come in favor and out of favor for, for good reason. But uh, let's, let's talk about that as we go here. The, uh, get back on the screen here. Okay, the key takeaways, you know, even with the low, especially with the low price environment, you know, getting your completion costs down and while still maintaining, you know, maximum recovery from your reservoir is critical for economic survival. It's no longer optional like it was with higher prices. Now it's, you really get it. Uh, it's the fourth quarter in that respect. Uh, and refracting organic shell wells, you know, primary wells we're talking about, but really any any organic shell well that has adequate oil in place and low recovery factor provides a unique opportunity to produce more hydrocarbons at less cost. And we're gonna, hopefully we'll show you it can deliver superior returns in new well drilling and completions, particularly if you get into the new, to, to the reserve booking aspect. That is a gigantic issue that People haven't really tapped yet, but uh, we'll talk about that. You know, it's, it's, it's probably the most significant development that will allow you to, you know, add a huge amount of asset value for a very minimal cost relative to what it would normally do. Um, and the study we've done a study. We did a 200 well study just recently, uh, and that was just permian. We've added another 50 wells from Eagleford and Marcellus to that, but um, basically, you've got the potential there to significantly improve field economics and results that people getting in the past using extreme limited entry, which we'll talk about in detail, and also mechanical isolation using expandable liners, which, you know, there's different, two different types of mechanical isolation and the expandables hopefully will show is definitely the best way to go. And the biggest opportunities right now, you know, the pure gas plays where the market's still decent, uh, Haynesville, Marcellus, Down Dip, Eagleford. Uh, we're getting a lot of interest from the Eagleford right now and the Marcellus from people talking to us about, you know, uh, about doing some refract work, those areas popped up uh, after the uh, second black swan event we had in the oil business. But uh, the other thing is in the oil window itself, uh, in the oil window of the Eagleford and the Southern Midland Basin. Southern Midland Basin, it was actually you know, like more like tier two acreage out there. And, but now with the study results, we're looking at you know, some significant uh, upside to going back in, 
primarily because it was one of the first place week. You know, they hopefully you're going to be producing on these for a number of years. So it's the strip price that really matters. And there's your, those are two NYMEX strip prices for oil and gas. Oil is not where we want it to be. Uh, gas is fairly stable. But I think you'll see when we start running the numbers on these real examples that uh, it's, it's still economic. You know, it's in, in refracts are much more economic than new well development as far as if you've got the right candidates identified, which is, which is critical. And also the ability to book behind pipe reserves is, is huge. People haven't even started tapping that at all yet, which is big. But, uh, you know, again, you've you got to use the present value method. You know, you're looking at the PV10, uh, looking at what the present value is, what's the rate of return over the life of the well. Um, you know, the current spot prices, you know, hurt and you know, very painful. But the bulk of this net present value is not going to be, you know, next week. It's going to be over time. Granted, earlier in the cycle, the better, you know, due to the time value of money. But still, you know, you've got wells, you know, I heard the other day from one of the XPPs at range that, they're, the auditors are allowing them to book 55 years of production on these. And, you know, when we're doing these analysis up there, you know, we're cutting it off at 30 years on our UR analysis. But even then, at the 30-year point, a lot of them are still economics. So, you know, you're not, you're not going to get all your money next week at today's prices. You know, it's going to come in over time. So as long as this strip stays positive, and hopefully we sop up the extra inventory here, get it going sooner rather than later, you know, it's it's not as bad as it seems. You know, it's, you know, I know it's a little consolation to those of you watching your run checks go to zero, but, but you know, it, it's not as bad as it seems when you look at the future here. And it's, so we've kind of changed our, you know, <laughs> one of the things we're getting is a lot of interest in gas. So, you know, let's it's, it's make America's old oil and gas wells great. And how's that sound? <laughs> you get to follow a common theme these days. So, and we've got the potential to do that now. I think, you know, now we have the tools in house to be able to go out there and, and make these work and get superior economics to new wells, which I think, you know, if I was given this back in 2015, when, when people were still trying to do diverter type jobs, I wouldn't make that statement. You know, back then it was just, you know, Hail Mary. You know, you were trying to do the, you're trying to hope for the best and throw a junk in the hole, but as well as that five and 600 perforations in there. And you're trying to do all that in one track stage basically and divert it through, you know, it's, just, it's just messy. But, um, you got to really feel lucky <laughs> to do that work, and very few of them work very well. They might have been economic, you know, but you know, you'll see from the slide at the end of the talk here that the uh, XTO project they talked about up in the Bakken. I mean, they were in there doing you know diverter jobs back in you know 2008, 2009, and, and making economic wells, but on the order of 100 to 200 barrels a day. You know, <laughs> when they gave they that question that at the conference in Banff, I raised my hand and said, hey. Have you guys heard that, you know, Brigham's up there making 2,000 barrel a day wells on new wells? You're, you're bright at 200 a day refract. I mean, come on. <laughs> Why not just line it and make a new well out of it? You know, oh, no, no, it's too expensive. So, you know, but, but that, that's what you're looking at. They were, they were economic with diverter some, most of the time, but, you know, just marginally economic. You didn't spend that much to start with. So, you know, you didn't have to make that much. But the problem was you didn't make that much. So now all different. Now you can expect pretty much you know, new well completion results off of the new rock that's in there. Now, the old rock, you're just recharging, but out of the new rock, you ought to see this, that you have a new well. And what's really been nice about this study, again, it was almost 200 wells in the, in the Permian, and we've done you know, numerous wells in the other uh, is, since the price crash, because gas is back on the radar again. It was, it was off the radar for years, uh, you know, since you know, like 14 or so, but, or even 09. But uh, what we're seeing is as, as people get clusters closer and closer together, uh, you know, you're getting pretty much the whole, the whole deal. Uh, uh, basically, you've got the, uh, uh, you know, you're getting recovery factors that are very similar to what we're seeing with new well completions on, uh, on conventional reservoirs. Let me go ahead and get these people in. <laughs> um, you know, solution gas drive, 15%. You know, we're seeing 13 and a half. For, you know, 12, 14 percent recovery factor. Uh, gas wells, you know, you, you assume probably 70 percent recovery factor in low perm. We're seeing 59, high 50s on those. Uh, the ones we're able to, you know, determine were done right and, and close to well control. So, which that's pretty exciting because that, that that gives you an upper limit on these things. You know, and, and realistically, if you're stimulating the entire rock volume and creating the permeability throughout the entire rock volume, it should behave like a conventional reservoir. It, it makes common common sense. It does. You know, it's just common sense that it does. Yeah. 
And then basically we did analyses in all these. We cut a lot of these out of this uh, shortened version. Uh, and this, the full school, we have them in there, but we've done analyses in all these, Eagle for gas, uh, Marcellus gas, uh, Permian uh, oil, Eagle for oil. And all four different areas have got good refract opportunities, many good refract opportunities, even if it's depressed prices. So again, just, and especially in the areas like down Dip Eagleford and Marcellus, you know, they started those plays way before a lot of the liquids rich plays. So you've got cluster spacings as much as 90 feet in some of these areas, which is tremendous considering you're down on 15 feet now. You know, uh, you know even in the old window of the Midland Basin, which has been kind of a, you know, you know, stepchild area for a number of years here. Uh, you know, there's a lot of good plays. In fact, the example we're going to show you come up is actually from a tier two a Wolf Camp area in the economics, and the economics are pretty incredible. Uh, the earlier wells are clearly the better, better ones. And one of the best ones we have this was very, was very early in, in the play. It's one of the first ones they did. But um, but you know, we'll we'll show you that about 40 percent of the wells out there have cluster spacings that look that make them candidate for refracts in that area. This is a neat slide. Uh, University of Texas or University of Lands did a big simulation study and it basically showed that your, uh, your, your optimum or your, your expected recovery factor with a 10-foot cluster spacing is around just under 14%. We're seeing 13 and a half in the same area. What's also exciting about this is we've all we've got 10 wells we picked out of the, of the older group just to you just pick 10 to you know, do 10. Not particularly, just they had wide cluster spacing and were best candidates, but you know, 10 out of that group. The average is about 4.6%, and look where that falls on the curve, 56 foot. So, you know, are the points in between right? You know, probably, but you know, the key thing is here, if you've got less than a 6.75% or plus or minus 6% recovery factor, you, you do two refracts, you're gonna make more oil than a new well. And there's a lot of wells out there. We're gonna show you that coming up here. So this is a pretty, very key slide, and it's, it's going to be very similar for the other plays. Uh, it might be a little bit spread on gas wells because the gas is gas has a little better mobility than oil does, but but nonetheless, there's going to be a, a point in there where where you're going to be you're going to be better off doing two refracts for the same amount of money as you would for a new well, and you're going to get more oil. Uh, closer cluster spacing. This is from that same study. You know, clearly closer cluster spacing gives you better wells. You're drink, you're increasing your stimulated reservoir volume. So that, you know, you ought to make more oil. This was really a neat example from South Texas in the Eagleford, basically uh, an operator drilled a monitor well 70 feet away from a producing well and saw that basically only 7.5 feet, 15% you know, of the rock was producing, 5% of the rock was not producing. And this operator subsequently went to 15, went to seven and a half foot spacing on several wells, tried that and didn't see much difference between that and the 15 foot spacing. So they're back on 15 foot. But, but clearly not 50 and clearly not 90. The first eagle for wells down there, the Petrohawk Discovery well down there, there was 90 foot cluster space. So here's the historical, this is the op opportunity there. Look at these spacings on here. Marcellus says 50, but really in 2011, I think it was more like 90. The uh, project I was working on was over nine. He had over 450 wells with 90 foot cluster spacing up there. Um, and in best practices, I say 15 feet. Again, we may, you may be able to stretch that out a little bit in Marcellus. The more we looked at it, the more we realized that we are getting some matrix drainage there as well which is not the case in the liquids rich areas. What's the size of the prize? Well, this is a Southern Midland Basin study. We had like 140 wells we looked at down there. Uh, and again, we got individual production from the operators. Uh, we got the data from the operators. We did not use public data. And it's the public data. People that use public for these studies, are, you, have my, you have my sympathies. <laughs> it's, a, it's a mess. You really got to get the individual production. We did. We got individual well production. You know, what, you know keeping the data confidential, of course, but you know, we got individual well production on every single one of these wells, so we know exactly what they're making. We didn't have to try allocations or anything. But almost 40% are have under 40 clusters. Now, does that necessarily make it a refract candidate? No, really. You just got to have oil in place. You got to have adequate oil in place. You've only got 30 feet of pay, and you got a low recovery factor. Well, that's not going to help you. You know, you you, you got to have enough pay to make it work. So we look at all of that. This is a really neat little example. Those are the 10 wells we talked about. The uh, your your Internal rate of return for the refract itself is in is in the numbers there. Fifty three percent was the top, two of the top seventy three. That number ten was definitely one of the first wells, and, and it's more of an anomaly. I think the, the rule is more like the 29, 25 percent ones in the middle. There's a lot of those out there. Uh, there are not too many of the big ones out there, but they they sure look good, don't they? <laughs> and then the price strip is down below. We're using the price strip. This is current prices. You see, it's not really getting 
fantastic. I mean, remember, I remember just a couple of months ago, people were saying we're not going to make it on $50 oil. Well, it, it's, look where $50 is. It doesn't happen for a few years out based on the, the strip right now. But um, this is kind of a neat study. And what's also neat is if you went back in and looked at the new well, if a, a new well was drilled where the refract well was right now, say an identical reservoir, that's the red bar. If you did best prices, you know, 13.5% recovery factor, <clears throat> that's the red bar. Well, if you do two refracts in that same rock, you know, just, just pick wells right around it, uh, the green bar, which is higher than the red bar. So basically doing two refracts is going to give you more oil for the same price as, as a new well would. So that's what the key there. There's your delta. And what's really interesting, this is a very, very key slide to the whole talk. You know, if you do seven new wells, $2 million a P, we're going to do about $42 million of expense, 17% rate of return. We'll do seven refracts at $3 million. And these, these are high costs now. I think we, we're, we're going to be able to get them under that, especially in this area. You know, you're looking at a 37% rate of return and a higher NPV for the same amount of money. I mean, not the same, it's basically half the amount of money. So this makes, this makes a lot of sense. You know, you're looking at refract, a seven well, you've got a choice between doing a seven well refract program or a seven well new well program. Look what you get here. Now the third point down here is huge. And I think people were just starting to get a handle on this. <clears throat> and especially during this low price environment, uh, if we're gonna talk about this at the very end. The, if you've got consistent results from your refracts and you've got a consistent economic results, and you can show five, six, seven times, you know, the numbers up to the reserve auditors, really. But a number I've been getting from Ryder Scott and uh, one of the other big banks or bank uh, investment banking places is saying five or six should do it. Uh, once you start showing you can refract a zone, you can start booking behind pipe reserves. And that is huge right now. So now imagine, you take this case in, in particular. If you, if you went ahead and did seven refracts on this particular area and showed economic results, Every single well around there becomes a behind pipe reserve on a PV20 basis. Talk about maximizing your asset value for the minimum amount of cash. That's a home run in, in any ballpark. So that's something we didn't really talk about until recently. But uh, we mentioned a long time ago and people said, oh, yeah, okay, well, I'm not, I'm not going to do seven refracts. So, okay, well, now I think things are a little bit different. If you can go ahead and prove up your reserves for $1 million versus you drill in seven new wells for 42 million, you know, the, the multiplying effect on the uh, behind pipe reserves could be, depending on how many wells you have, 10 to one maybe, you know, huge, huge return. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. Okay, this is the kind of the workflow. I'll, I'll kind of go through this, kind of just lay this all out here. This is the steps that we recommend to do everything. We're not gonna cover these today. This is what we cover in the school and in the longer version here, but you know, basically, how much is there, you know, to start with? And you know, what's your height? What's your drainage height? Look at your rock properties. Uh, come up with an EUR, uh, you know, with new completions, that's key. Uh, with, with maximum SRV completions, basically, you wanna get that, what that number is. And whatever that is, difference between that and the number you have now, it gives you an EUR for the refrac, and then you use a type curve for the area with decline by month percentage, and just allocate that your monthly production until you get a, you know, Iterate on your IP, but the whole C can excel, and stretch this up. And then when you get the execution part, you know, the expandable liner, extreme limited entry, close cluster spacing, one hole per cluster, uh, rate max, rate optimization, uh, you know, the frac optimization in, in, within the cluster is important. Those are the steps we go to next. Isolations, you know, again, diverter world, trying to divert five, 600 perforations, you know, was, was not a good idea. Uh, mechanical isolation, you know, is what we recommend. Uh, cemented liners or expandable liners are really the only two options out there. Uh, and if you combine that with XLE, uh, you're able to take full advantage of the additional rate. For the, you know, you're going to be able to pump fewer pump stages and overall lower cost per barrel or MCF. So new wells works as well. Uh, you know, it's, 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 it's pretty much mandatory for refracts to do XLE. Uh, you've got to control the flow into the old perfs. Uh, none of the other methods do that very well. Even diverter, diverter is kind of hit or miss. Uh, it sometimes can hit, but XLE by far is the best way to go. Uh, here's an example from the Eagleford. Uh, you're going to look at about three and a half inch submitted versus the, the expandable 4.1 ID. You're going to be able to pull about 20 barrels a minute more rate with the expandable. Uh, you can go with more clusters per stage. You're going to go longer stages. And, long and fewer stages. 
in longer stages, and we always get pushback on that, saying, well, we're going to shorter stages, like the Cellus example I looked at earlier. Uh, you, you had 130 foot stages and they were putting five clusters in there. Uh, I think it was Chesapeake who was reporting that. Um, you know, okay. But if you start making those stages longer, isn't that making my production going to go down? Well, SM did a really neat little study with fiber optic that showed that you can increase your cluster, your stage length by 25% and still see, actually get better performance in this particular example. They got better diversion using limited entry. And again, you know, 2,000, 3,000 PSI delta peak, uh, equal entry hold. And then basically that's your findings right there. They actually got better coverage with longer stages. You know, so it doesn't really matter how long your stages are. That's, that's kind of a, you know, that, that, that's a result of keeping existing perforation strategies, <laughs> you know, like phase perforating, lots of holes. Uh, that's why people had to go to shorter stages. Well, if you don't do that, if you follow the one hole per, one hole per cluster recommendation we have, get your 2,800 to 3,000 pound delta P, you can you know, make ages as you want. You're really going to be, all you're going to be limited by is the amount of rate that goes into each one. You have to have at least six barrels a minute and probably higher, depending on the rock type. We'll show you how we determine that number later. But this is a, this is a key slide to the whole talk because basically it shows you can go with longer stages and still maximize your SRV. That stage length is not a critical issue. It's the, the, the cluster efficiency within that stage is the critical issue. And with XLE, you can see right here, you're hitting it out of the park. Okay, key, key challenges, you gotta control your entry points. You wanna try and get 100% of your uh, new rock stimulated. It wasn't stimulated the first for the wider cluster spacings. Uh, if it's a parent well or primary well, you wanna recharge the depleted intervals. But even on a, even on a well where you're not trying to, uh, where you're not trying to, uh, you know, recharge existing depleted zones. You know, you want to keep that fluid from running away in there. You know, like you, you want to make sure that all your fluid doesn't go into an existing perf. You want to put some of the new rock or most of it in there. Again, premium optimized frack. We've talked about what we do there. You know, the expandables again. And XLE is going to give you 85 to 90% cluster spacing, you know, with uh, basically, yeah, I've already shown that slide. Here's an example for uh, uh, Permian wells, uh, as far as the, uh, this is from our SPE paper we presented in Calgary last fall. Uh, pretty big savings there, because you're going with larger ID, gives you a lot fewer stages, a lot more efficient, and you know, the, the numbers are really good. I mean, you combine this, you combine the expandables with the lower service costs that we're seeing these days, you know, it's, it's really gonna make refracts something that everybody needs to be looking at, because you, it's not gonna be as expensive as it was last year, more than likely. And with these understandings we have now, we should be able to do it with a minimum, you know, to minimize the risk involved, minimize surprises. That's the key thing. I mean, this, this whole system we're recommending is going to give you the fewest surprises out there. Okay. Execution, we are able to you know, stimulate, you know, with XLE, you can do short space clusters with high cluster efficiency. And again, SRV is what it's all about. The more your SRV, the higher your EURs. And one hole per cluster we recommend, and that's kind of a new deal that just came out of Liberty last year at one of the conferences we went to. Uh, and basically that, you know, that, that's, we'll talk about that. It gives you a much better, uh, uh, much better energy into the frack itself, because if you have more than one hole, you're going to create multiple fractures near the wall, and they'll coalesce into one fracture if you have no more than two well-bar diameters, I think it's four well-bar four well diameters. But that's, that's not good. If you have one single entry hole, you're going to get the maximum width, with, you know, you're, wasting the little, you're wasting the minimum amount of near well bore friction. Near well bore friction is, is, is hurts you. It, you don't want near well bore friction because that, that reduces the energy you can put into the, into the rock. So we, we pretty much eliminate that with the zero one hole. Plus, if you do a step down test, you know how many clusters are open. So, so. Again, some of the overall advantages, you know, 7,500 foot lateral, you can get eight fewer frack stages. That's a biggie, that's pretty big. And it costs a little bit more to expandables, but you know, you get it back. It's, it's, you definitely get it back. You can pay me now or pay me later on the commercial term. Okay, let's talk, show how the liner works. This is the basic system. Let's get my, my smug out of the way here. You run the assembly down hole. You're pulling the mandrel through. Time I saw this, I thought of a python swallowing a pig. <laughs> so it's a pretty neat system. And then this is uh, you can do five thousand feet at a time. If you have a longer lateral, you can you can run multiple uh, strings in there. Fairly neat system, right? Okay. 
Okay, perforating best practices. Uh, this is this is important. XLE we've talked about already, but how do we know that this stuff is working? You know, and and what really made the difference there was fiber optics. Being able to monitor what's going on down hole in terms of temperature, acoustic, and pressure it's, it's changed things a lot. And these two studies came out of Liberty. Uh, Paul Weddle was the primary author. Mark Pearson was involved as well. That 2,000 pounds, the minimum number for the pad, but really that number is, is kind of old because you really, to get 1,500 pounds at the end of the job, you got to have about 2,800 pounds at the beginning to start with. But then everybody, you'll see that in the data coming up. Uh, again, we talked about that. The 300 pound post erosion uh, target is the one you want. A uniform hole size is important. You, you want to be able to have a predictable pressure drop, and then there's charges out there for that. Um, and six barrels a minute per cluster is the minimum, and that's just to keep from screening out, really. Uh, you probably need, uh, uh, you know, that's what typically overrides the delta P, and you typically end up with larger holes. Like our, tip, our recommendations now typically on these things are, you know, 0.5 inch holes, 1.5 inch hole every cluster, and six to nine barrels a minute uh, rate. And again, we're not really sure yet, and if we're feeling our way through this, uh, it's possible if the well is highly depleted that we will need to do a higher prop. Uh, but we'll see on that. This was a really neat uh, paper. It was just presented by Kyle, Kyle Hosfeit at, uh, at Dev, Devon. There's the number up there. They monitored the pressure in the sealed well bore offsetting the, uh, the infill well frack. The, the monitor wells you know, is basically your parent well, your primary well. And what they did was a the high volume to first response and low volume to first response is basically if you've got a high volume to first response, like if you don't see the, the response in the monitor well until late in the job, that means that XLE was working. If you see it right away, that means you had a runaway. You either hit a natural fracture or you hit a depleted zone or it just didn't divert. And they did this plot here, which is kind of neat. The, uh, your, your friction pressure is up there in that uh, you know, perforation friction there. You'll see the orange ones, the yellow ones there. You know, at basically, you know, 2,500 to 2,750 pounds had the, you know, the highest volume pumped prior to seeing that interruption. Now, if you're down in a low range, less than 1,000 pounds, you know, I think it's less than 1,500 pounds. Actually, you're, you're seeing it right away, almost. So, it's actually, this is, this is proof that XLE works. We've been telling people it works because the physics are very simple. You're just basically limiting the rate going into each perf by having a high friction pressure, a pressure drop. But this proves it works, which is nice. This and the longer stage experiment SM did, these two both came out of the frac conference back in, in Woodlands. This was probably the most significant frac conference for refracts I've seen in a number of years. These two findings are huge because basically they prove what we're saying is correct. You know, that the, the longer stages are okay as long as you keep the pressure drop down and uh, our up pressure drop up. This shows that XLE does work. So. Other options, uh, engineered completions come up all the time where people you try to perforate like rock within an interval. Uh, the other thing is dropping uh, diversion during the stage, you know, not, not trying to divert the entire well bore, but divert. And XLE, we think, is better than those two. Uh, stage diversion is fine, but you can, if you're trying to protect a parent well or a primary well, you might prematurely shut that uh, cluster off and still have a depleted zone. Um, Engineer completions are fine. Uh, in fact, we've got an operator I'm working with now that's been using them quite a bit. You get good cluster efficiency, but the problem is if you start moving your clusters farther out, you're going to have gaps in the SRV. So you've got to be careful not to be running too wide a spacing on the engineer completions. You know, you, you almost geometric is to me, geometric with XLE gives you the same cluster efficiency as an engineer completion does, which is a lot harder to do and a lot more expensive. I mean, the, uh, operator I'm working with is running open the logs on the lateral to get the get his, get his stuff. Uh, you may not need to do that. You know, it's it's. I think the, the XLE with post cluster spacing and you know high delta P should allow you to get the same results. Actually, better results because you're going to stimulate more rock. So, and you can probably move that spacing out in some areas. You know. The other thing that's just recently come up is you know we found out in this this uh, in this study we did that the wells, particularly in the Permian, are producing from between the frac barriers. If you assume they have a certain height, uh, you get random results. If you go and say, this looks like a good barrier, and then you run it through the 3D frac model and say, yeah, this is what looks like it. And the 3D frac models are fairly simple on these. It's basically, you're, if you're doing limited entry, extreme limited entry on a well, and you've got 90 barrel a minute pump rate, and you get 15 clusters, you're just modeling it at six barrels a minute. So you need a single well, and that's you got issues with shadowing, and you may not be characterizing it 100% correctly, but it's pretty close. And you'll see from the example that it does. But uh, you may not, you may not 
want to stay at six, you may want to increase your rate. Uh, you know, we showed that clearly that you, your, your height of the frack between the stress barriers is where it's producing from. But, you know, are you stuck with that when you do the refrack? And, you know, you, what you can do is go back and model the original job with the original fluid and the original rate and then see what that height is. If that height agrees with the drainage height, then probably, uh, you're probably spot on. But what if that drainage height is limited by, say, a thin barrier, for instance, and the first frack probably didn't go through there? Well, then you've got some options. You know, you can go back and look at it, and, you know, make sure your numbers are right, but it's possible that you could establish new above and below, the, uh, above and below your existing perps. You know, that you, your new rock, you think of new rock as along the lateral. Well, <clears throat> it may, you may be able to get new rock above and below as well. Let me click on here. You see. So, you know, initially, if it, if it stopped, say, for instance, your initial treatment uh, didn't go above that barrier, you know, look at your design and say, well, what if I increase my rate per cluster, which you do by simply reducing the number of clusters, and then run, say, a 15, 20 centipoise uh, high viscosity friction reducer, something like that, and then see what it does. And then possibly access new rock above and below. Here's the rock we're looking at. The, the two blue bars are what we use for the production map. Actually, we started with the production match assuming the second barrier down was where the barrier was down here. And we got recovery factor didn't quite add up, but then we went ahead and looked at it. But then when we ran a 3D model, we saw this is where it was in the original job. They got regular slick water with six barrels a minute. So we went ahead and loaded the stress profile, which is in green here, Young's modules and Poissons and rock properties into uh, MFRAC, the you know, 3D track model. And this is what we got. And what happened here was the original job, was the original track was between these two blue lines. Well, what we're seeing here by going with a higher, you know, higher rate per cluster, we went ahead and went with nine barrels a minute. So we cut the clusters back and then increased the, the viscosity and the, and the fluid. Bingo, you just added 20% to your OIP per acre down below there. So it opens up a whole new realm of possibilities on, on this, particularly in the Permian. Uh, you don't typically have this problem in Eagleford, don't have it in the Marcellus, but it is, it is a problem in the Permian. This last part is very important, uh, you know, and again, I've, I've talked about it. Nobody's doing it yet to my knowledge. However, I mean, there was back in 2015, uh, uh, Holroyd, uh, I think she, I forget where she was then, but she's uh, pretty active in the investment banking community right now, put this thesis out there that, hey, why can't we book refract reserves, PUDs? And then went ahead and, and kind of went through the, you know, the PRMS, the SPE, uh, you know, the reserve valuation uh, Bible, and, and looked at what the requirements are for booking offset reserves. And basically these are the three things came up with, you know, is it, it incremental non-acceleration of existing production, organic shows, that shouldn't be a problem. Uh, establish a reasonable certainty that the operation is successful. And that basically means you gotta be economic each time. And that's why your, your PUDs are so valuable in the uh, organic shale world for new wells is that you, you know you're gonna get re repeatable results. <clears throat> you know, if you drill 10, 10 wells in an area that you're gonna get consistent results from all, all these. You know, you can't have one dry hole and then a success. And you, you've got to be consistently successful. Uh, with diverter, that was not a certainty. Now with the liners, yes, that's a certainty. You're going to get the same type of fracks put away as you would a new oil. And the last ones should generate a large enough, large enough number of successful refracts to establish confidence in the process. That number, you know, we, we, I've asked a number of people what that number needs to be. Uh, look at some logs when horizontal wells came out. Uh, what uh, Shell Canada found was that it needed about six to generate consistent results. Uh, uh, Tim Decision and Frack Knowledge did one with refracts, same thing. Uh, the XO, XTO uh, Bakken program, they did a bunch of diverters fracks back in 2008 or so. And this is the uh, plot from that. And you know, it's like I say, good thing they didn't stop after the initial five failures. You know? <laughs> so, uh, but look at those numbers there. That's your, that's your post refract number in the Bakken shale. You know, you're looking at what most of these were like uh, slotted liners or, you know, or, you know, they did very few cemented completions, uh, you know, Packers Plus type stuff. You know, look at those numbers. And that's when I raised my hand on this when I saw that. I said, you know, you realize that your offset operators up there like Brigham are making several thousand barrels a day on these wells. <laughs> this is what you're getting off diverter jobs. I mean, don't you guys think you might want to be relining us? Oh, no, that's too expensive. <laughs> so that's the, that was the attitude, uh, you know, from the operators up there is, yeah. And these were probably economic, you know, if you, you don't spend that much on a diverter job, so you don't have to make that much. But, you know, imagine what these would look like if you went ahead and just went ahead and did a complete reline and refract, you know, and then you're seeing several thousand barrels a day coming out of these wells when they're done properly.
So to wrap this up, um, we think you've got a unique opportunity in organic shales to increase production more efficiently with refracts. And you, especially if your current refractors are less than half of the optimized numbers, uh, you know, you have the potential to put for two refracts with the same, which would be the same cost as any well, you could actually increase production and get lower cost per barrel. <clears throat> we think it's important that you use mechanical isolation without a doubt, uh, no more diverters, you know, maybe enabling diverters within the stage itself, actually. Uh, XLE and the expandables, you know, the XLE is not more expensive, but the mechanicals are a little more expensive, but you know, it's a pay me now, pay me later type thing. You're going to be able to get uh, a fairly decent ROI on that and also just basically get it done as cheaply as possible. You, know, you don't want to spend any more money now than you have to on these. The, uh, you know, and refract programs have the potential to produce more hydrocarbons at lower cost and be superior to oil drilling programs. That seven well example I showed you is a perfect example. That's in a tier two area that's not real popular right now for new well drilling. And yet you're looking at having a quite a much 37% versus 17% rate of return on your money. And the other thing is if you can use it to prove up your reserves, which you talked about, you know, this is what I'm talking about is a seven well refract program. You know, basically you have a higher rate of return and net present value from a lower cost. And then the last one is, 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 is the 800 pound gorilla that nobody's really looking at, but, if, imagine if you'd taken, if you'd done those seven wells and been able to book all, you know, the operator we're working with has something like 200 wells down. Uh, you know, imagine if you could take those seven well refract program and turn around and convert that into PV20 PUDs for every single well out there that you haven't refract yet. Your present value of a 20, 30 barrel a day, you know, 2011 shale well is not going to be the same as the PV20 on that of a refract. You can go back in and, you know, turn that into a three or 400 barrel a day well. You know, you can, you've got to use a higher discount rate to value the PUD, but that's huge. That has the potential to significantly increase asset base at the absolute lowest cost possible. I mean, do seven refracts and book reserves for your entire field. So I think that's something that we're just scratching the surface on right now. Okay, I think we can open it up for questions now. Anybody got any questions? Yeah, don't be shy if you've got anything to say. Garrett, Garrett. Yeah, the Garrett. questions. Thanks for the presentation. Um, do you have you ever seen a refract on a more modern well? I know, you know, I'm with Oventive and we've done a couple on some, you know, older age wells, but I didn't know if you've ever seen any on a, you know, more modern, a little bit tighter cluster spacing. You know, obviously it wouldn't be your first candidate, but wanted to see if there was any success there. And then the other question I had was. A little bit, if you can expand on the expandable liner, um, just what are the risks you've seen associated with that? Sure, sure. Yeah, obviously, that, and that's the big reason that, uh, like, I, I talked to Kyle uh, Devin, you know, and he handles all their stuff all over and asking, why aren't you doing more Permian refracts? And because you, you clearly need to do, and we didn't spend much time talking about parent well protection, uh, primary well protection. Uh, it's a, I, I can kind of foresee the, the uh, pad development being kind of, dormant for a little bit you're gonna have a lot of ducks in the pond out there before you see people going back to doing six well zipper fracks i think <laughs> so i mean that, that was where uh, that was the primary issue there if you if, you're, if you have a frack a child or infill well next to a parent well that hasn't been refract you're going to lose about 40 percent of your reserves on your, your infill well so i mean the economics there are not going to be based on the oil in place necessarily uh if you've already got fairly say you've got 30 foot cluster spacing on a well in the wolf camp in west texas and uh 1,500 pounds per foot, uh, a lateral foot. Uh, you know, if you didn't use XLE, you know, you might have a 50, 60 percent cluster efficiency. So if it was poorly perforated to start with, there's 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 a chance there because we're not considering that in these numbers. If you've got a, a uh, uh, this portion here, the um, that part of it, you, you know, you you could potentially, if you say, for instance, you went in there and had too many holes and didn't get any kind of diversion, and the statistically Though that type of completion gives you a 59% cluster efficiency, whereas the, the uh, uh, XLE will give you 85 and above. So it's possible you could have a well, you know, and the recovery factor will show you that. That's, that'll come out in the recovery factor. You could have a brand new well that, you know, just wasn't properly diverted, maybe, you know, and one thing that can happen if you don't divert properly and you run into like a natural fracture or something like that, you know, people have seen frack hits on wells miles away. 
And that's usually indication that you got into an existing natural fracture. Okay, well, what if you happen to have one of those in your stage? You're going to lose that whole stage in that one cluster. So you got a lot of new rock you can get with XLE. Uh, so even if a well is only three or four years old that has relatively close cluster spacing, if it's a parent well or primary well, when you're going to offset it with a child, and you had poor cluster spacing, yeah, or poor cluster efficiency. You might have had the clusters there, but if you didn't use XLE or diverter, you may have only fracked one or two clusters out of the, you know, out of the four. You, know, you may have only fracked half your clusters. Yeah, but, and that'll show up. In fact, we have an example from Midland County, which is a three or four year old well, that, I, that probably had some diversion questions, had like a 7% recovery factor. Uh, you know, and we did the numbers on that. It actually was economic. Now that was a, you know, a $30 oil mixture. We haven't really looked at that. But, but you know, it, it's definitely the older ones are better. On the expandables themselves, uh, as far as the risk factors, uh, I might I might bring Mark on for that to kind of go over the, the recent history on that. Mark, have you? Have yeah, some Bob, um, uh, Garrett, that's a that's an excellent question. We get that question quite often. Um, uh, I would say that the the largest risk to uh, to an expandable operation is not any different than uh, running your uh, your uh, cemented liner as well. Is is hole cleaning. Um, it's real important that uh, that the hole is prepped and and ready to run the liner. Um, that's probably the, the biggest risk. Um, uh, but once you if you have good hole cleaning and um, you know you, you we haven't had any issues of getting to bottom. Um, we just as a matter of fact uh, yesterday uh, installed a 5700 footer. In, up in the Marcellus um, uh, continuous liner. Uh, so uh, you can have a lot of success if you, if you prep the hole uh, correctly. Okay, Does that answer, answer your question, Garrett? Yeah, thank you. Great, great. Okay, anybody else with questions? Yeah, I've got a quick question. This is John Dung with Pioneer, and thank you for sharing this and talking about this um, aspect here. Um, question I have for you is on the frack design on the reef rack, especially if you're not using a, an expandable liner and you're just using um, diversion, so whatever you use, whether it's pods or otherwise. Um, can you talk a little bit about your thoughts on, on your approach on how you divide up um, the volumes that you pump before you pump your diverters? Um, <laughs> hmm. I'm not sure I'd do that. I mean, I'm not sure I'd recommend it. I mean, you can run the economics on it. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, just go back to that XTO example. I mean, that, look at that deal there. I mean, that's, that's a perfect example of what you're just talking about. I mean, this is, this, these were actually considered reasonably successful these were considered to be reasonably successful refracts. Okay, they were happy with this program. They did 70 of these wells. So if it was not making money, they would have stopped a long time before they got to 70 wells. But look at your results here. I mean, this is a Bakken where if you if you went in, if you've got a Bakken well with a 5% recovery factor, for instance, and you, you know, which is we I did I did a, I looked at a Bakken well that was a, a dual lateral in the uh, three forks and that had, had make a 2% recovery factor, you know, <laughs> and because they'd done two bullhead fracks on each one. And if you went back in and did diverter on those, which you probably couldn't to begin with, but for instance, it was cemented and you did that, you'd get these results you're looking at here. You know, whereas if you put a new well together, you know, you're looking at several thousand. We, we, did, we did the economics on that one Bakken well. And basically it was a, we we're looking at recovering 400,000 barrels of incremental reserves by putting the liner in there and re-cementing it with the new frack. Uh, with the diverter, you're going to get what you got on the screen here. So, I mean, I would strongly discourage the use of diverter as an as an option for refracts, just because it's it's so hit or miss. I mean, and and, you, and they're not cheap still, because you still got to get rid of the water. I mean, you still got to buy the water and bring it in. You know, even these, these even these little preloads. If you do a full volume preload, which is probably cheaper than a, than a diverter frack, uh, you're probably looking at a million dollars on a 7,500 foot shale well, just because primarily because of the water costs involved in handling and all. Plus, you still got to get the service company out there. You can't pump this with a CNA truck. You know, you, you got to use a full frack spread. You know, you got to use a full $36 million frack spread, and those aren't cheap. But, uh, I mean, that's, there really isn't, you know, 
it's a it's a tough question because it's kind of going against what we're what we're recommending to people. But uh, you know, and if you are going to do it, I mean, I don't know. That's I don't, I'm not sure how to answer that question because it's they're really the Coralab or ProTechnics presented that paper you know meeting in 2015 where they talked about various ways to try and you know increase the length of the stimulated air, but but the results you're looking at stuff like you have on the board here. I mean, it's it's not, it's your results are going to be crummy. You're not going to get that. You might make money, but um, you know. A refract basically is the same as a new well frack. I mean, you, you want you don't want to do a refract any differently than a new well frack. You want to use plug-in perf, stream limited entry, you know, and just do it do it like you're fracking a new well. The only difference between a refract and a new well is your ID, and that's why the expandables make so much sense because you're getting a lot closer to the original ID when using expandable than you do if you have to use submitted liners. And we didn't talk about the four inch uh, flush joint too. That, that those are coming in. So, some operators that are doing this systematically have bought four inch flush joint. Uh, you still have a pretty good differential in value between those two because your rate's not going to be, you're still going to lose about 15, 20 barrels a minute off the, or, you know, off the uh, rate that you have them expandable with the four inch flush joint because you're down under four inches there. But uh, any rate, but um, anyway, I know, I know I probably didn't answer your question, but, <laughs> but, but anyway, hopefully the thoughts are, are relevant. Uh, this is good, good thoughts. Thank you. Sure. Bob, else? can you can you hear me there? This Not this there. yes, this is Doug Walser, and uh, good to see you again. Oh, and good. it was good presentation. Uh, in your uh, in the areas that you're working, uh, you know, I, I I think the focus has been on the liquid hydrocarbons for pure gas plays that you've been working on. What kind of uh, price point? Or, or do you start looking harder for for things to do? Uh, it, you know, in terms of a, a minimum price point for for trying to do some refracts just on pure gas plays. There is an example from the Marcellus. We did. Uh, we get, these are two Gen Four wells, uh, very close cluster spacing, 131 foot stage lengths. These are relatively recent wells, and that that confirms our 50 to 60 percent range. If you if you go in with that as your upside, and then you look at your refract uh, recovery model, actually that's these they're, they're close to each other. The wells that's this is just basically showing they're close to each other. But you know this particular deal here shows the economics of it. Um, you know 2012 well, uh, you know basically there's your numbers. Uh, low crop and loading 680 per foot, uh, 17 barrels a foot, long stages. Uh, you know basically you're looking at about 20% recovery factor to date. Uh, if you go back, bring that back to 60%, that's 6.6 .6 BCF at the current strip. Uh, this is what you get. I mean, pull it up here. And so that can make make sense at, at $3 then, right? Or, or There's your strip down there, 242 currents. 242. It doesn't even go, strip doesn't even go over three to make this work. Good. So, I mean, that's 42% rate of return. Uh, you know, refract cost. Three million, which you know, again, we use three million on just just for simplicity because uh, it's the cost is actually going to be lower than that. So this, these numbers should look even better. But yeah, yeah well, all Marcellus wells work. No, some areas like this in the Marcellus and even for gas, looking at these wells, you'll see a number of wells that were early wells that have relatively high recovery factors. You know, because gas is a lot more mobile than than, than, than liquids. So you, you have to be. It's not there's not as many like in the oil world. Almost every well that has high OIP and has you know, has a you know long cluster spacing is going to be a good candidate. But uh, gas world, you got to be more selective because occasionally you'll get you know, wells that outperform other wells without having good completions, which I thought is a real head scratcher. Part of that is also the the heterogeneity. Uh, I, I put the map up there earlier to show how close these wells are. We had one we were looking at in the Marcellus one area where we had we had about three miles between two control points, and there was a thirty percent difference in gas in place between the two wells. So if you got a well in between it, which gas in place do you use for your recovery factor? You know, we got you get a, you get a lot of random results just because I think a lot of the times, I mean, specific to the Eagleford and specific to the Marcellus, I think your reservoir heterogeneity is a lot more significant there than it is in liquids rich in the LA in the oil reservoirs. You can map your wolf camp and stuff in Permian wolf camp maps pretty well. You can go from well to well, and typically the properties don't change radically. But Marcellus was an eye opener, you know, because you got these wild recovery factors on some of these wells, but you go and look at your gas in place numbers, they're all over the map too, you know, where you've got well control. So it's, I think you've got wells fairly close to your well that you're working on 
to have a confidence that that gas in place number is right or, or have a really good map on it. So, good question, I, Doug. Real good. Thank you. Anybody else? Hey, Bob, it's Jay Matheson with uh, Sonovas here. I was just wondering what your thoughts are on if, if these expandable liners are kind of limited to cemented liner systems, or if you've seen them ran inside like an open hole ball drop with packers. I just don't see it working the way you explain it on an open hole ball drop system. Um, I'm not sure I understand the question. You, if you think you could you want to run it in an open hole system? Like, Normally, I, I think you run this expandable liner inside a cemented, like plug and perf completion yeah, to re right. that's, yeah, that's the tighten idea up your space. Right. But right. Uh, have you right. seen them ran on an open hole ball drop system with like s sleeves that you've milled out that we mill out, you know, open hole liner system with packers isolating the stages? Or do you think? Jay, yes. We, the answer is yes. We have we have run uh, an expandable in a in a, um, a system, um, mainly Packers Plus uh, and some Halliburton systems where they've drilled out the sleeves and, and we've relined uh, that completion tool. Now, in the case of an open hole liner where we're expanding uh, outside of the completion tool and up against the, the formation, um we we uh we haven't done any of those we've we've planned some um uh expansions into up against the formation but we haven't we haven't done any to date yeah, and in, in general i've discouraged that i mean because because one of the key things about this is maximizing your srv and to do that you've got to have fairly close cluster spacing and you've got to be have fairly high cluster efficiency uh with open hole out behind you unless you're submitted you know, uh, I guess, you know, it's possible if you're able to pull the liner out somehow and run the expandable in there, that would be an advantage there against the rock, maybe. I don't know. I, I'm kind of thinking outside the box, but, you know, cemented, perf, plug and perf type cemented have got the ability to give you the highest recovery factors and the highest stimulated reservoir volume. Trying to take shortcuts where you've got, you know, basically behind pipe, the, the Packers Plus systems, you know, you're basically only stimulating, you know, one or two fractures at the most versus, you know, 15. You can have 15 different entry points with a cemented liner at 90 barrels a minute, six barrels, you know, six barrels a minute per cluster. Uh, you're only going to have the effect of maybe two or three or the lower stress ones are all you're going to frack. You know, it, it's, it's, it's messy. You're not going to maximize, and I'd be surprised if it's economic if you do that. You know, mm -hmm. I think you yeah. Okay. Thanks, Bob. Good question, though, because there's a lot of those wells out there, particularly up in the Bakken. There's, there's a lot of those wells up there. Okay, we have one time for maybe one more question, if anybody has a question. Anybody else? Because we're right at 12 o'clock. Good job, Bob. Yeah. All right. Fine squirrel, fine squirrel. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Since nobody else has any more questions, we're Thank you all for attending today's webinar with Bob Barbe, sponsored by Inventure Global Technology. Um, we have been recording this session. You will be getting an email uh, later this week or first thing next week asking you for a little bit more information about yourself. And we will reply with a, uh, a copy of or a link to the video. Um, and uh, any additional information you want, just let us know. Um, and I think that's it, Bob. So thank you again for attending. And I'm going to end the meeting now, if that's OK with everybody. Is that all right, Bob? We'll see you soon. Face to face. Maria?